Hi. Uh, good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I just thought I'd uh, uh, do an update on part one of this double page spread I'm doing for Squiggly Pete, the pirate book. Um, but before I get into that, instead of messing around with the guitar, I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I gave up my successful career a few years ago as a web designer, amongst other things, to um, become a children's author. And this is my first book, The Boy of the Saucepan Hat. Now, many of you will uh, have already bought this or uh, had it through your school or something like this. It's the boy of a little book. It's a story of a little boy who gets a saucepan stuck on his head and he goes to the A&E department and uh, the doctors try to get it off. And the doctor says, goodness me, uh, the doctor was curious. What have we here? He said, prodding and poking poor Ollie. If you wanted to keep the cold rain off your head, why on earth did you not use a brolly? Yes, good question. But it turns out he was dreaming, you see, and he dreamt that he was fighting dragons, and he put the saucepan on his head as a sort of DIY homemade armour. And of course, they couldn't get it off. Uh, they x-rayed his head. There you are, see, with the saucepan. Oops, here we go, on his head. And they said, oh, I, I, we can't, but I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. I've never, you know, there's nothing that medical science can do. I've never seen nothing this bad. It's exactly what's bound to occur if you give such a thing to a ten-year-old lad. So, uh, I won't tell you what happens, but um, <laughs> he has to go into school with the saucepan stuck on his head. They cut out some holes and things, uh, perforations, so that he can uh, so get on with his work, you know. Anyway, I won't tell you what happens. That, that, that was the first book I released. Um, before that, for several years, I've been working on several others, which are still in the pipeline, including, let me just show you quickly, Mr. Wibbly Wobbly's Amazing Flying Bicycle by Martin Harvey. That's me there. Um, and this, hopefully, will be out for Christmas this year. Um, it's a story of a chap who, nice little family man there, Mr. Wibbly Wobbly, who um, is a bit eccentric. His wife's, oops, where's the camera? There we go. His wife's an opera singer, uh, but she sings all wobbly tunes and things. And he's a bit eccentric. He, he invent, he's obsessed with trying to get a bicycle to fly. And uh, they often go out for cycle rides together. There they are, cycling along the pier. And um, one day he says, I've got an idea. Guess what? I'm going to build a bike with a seat for all of us. We can all get on board and go for a ride. There he is in the morning sunshine, showing off his brand new bike. There we go. And um, he goes out and rides around. There they are, riding along the promenade in Ramsgate in Kent. This is where I used to live. So that's why it's based down there. It's a bit like the Screamy Peak one. Lots of local scenery. And there they are again, going along on this fantastic bicycle he's made. But uh, he keeps falling off, and people laugh at him and say, Oh, you silly old fool, Mr. Wibbly, Wibbly Wobbly. There they are, mocking him. And he says, I've got an idea. I'm going to build a bigger, better bike. And that night he goes to his shed. And there he is, banging away in the shed, creating something. See the little mice? How do I get this in the camera there? Yeah. And he creates an amazing flying bicycle. Shall I show you a little bit of that? Here he goes. Taking off on his amazing flying bicycle. Right, anyway, so I was working on this book. And as you see, I've made another working copy, as I always do. I print them out and stick them together. And I was working on this book. Um, when uh, my long-suffering partner, Sarah, said, you know, Martin, that's going to take ages to finish. You really should get something out. So I did. So I did a short one quickly, Boy with the Saucepan Hat, so that we could get that out. And that still took months to do because I had to learn the whole process of self-publishing, including dealing with um, the printing companies and the specifications, very detailed technical specifications they require. Now, luckily, I was a web designer uh, and computer programmer before this, so I knew... Uh, you know, the tech, I knew a lot of the technical stuff, but you still have to learn all the specifics to the printing industry. So I learned a lot about that. That was very interesting. Anyway, that's the first book. And um, then we had the lockdown and um, some local people said to me, uh, Martin, could you do some, you know, online Zoom sessions for local children who are stuck at home? So I said, yeah, fine. I came up with this story, you know, the story of Squiggly Pete the Pirate. Uh, there he is uh, in the background here. 
Uh, there it is, a Squiggly Pete, Little Jack, and Lucy. And if you want to find out more about that, go to, let's see if I can do it on here, <laughs> squigglypete.co.uk for more information. Now, before I get into the drawing, because I'm going to be doing more on that double page spread I was working on yesterday, before I get into that, I'll just show you another couple of things, some of the things I do. Here's a spider. Okay. There we go. Because I write, po I, I started writing a book called Bugs, Beasts and Biscuits, which is still going to come out soon, hopefully. Um, I've written all the text. There's lots and lots of poems about beetles and insects and millipedes and weevils and things like that. Um, and I might start uploading them here, actually, if anyone's interested. Anyway, this is a little pen and ink thing I did. It's quite an old fashioned sort of style, but I do like that. Just simple uh, pen and ink and the spider. He's in prison. Now, if you'd like to find out why, you can actually find, you can actually hear me reading the story on SoundCloud. Here we are. And YouTube. Now, um, so I'm getting reflections here everywhere. Now, if you go to YouTube and search for Martin Harvey, the poet, M-A-R-T-Y-N-H-A-R-V-E-Y, the poet, on YouTube or SoundCloud, you'll either see more of my videos oh yes there's, there's a video of the spider one actually which is quite interesting it's quite scary right i'll tell you now it's quite scary so go to youtube search for martin harvey the poet and look at my video the spider okay right i hope you enjoy that right putting that aside let's get into what i've got uh, set up to do today now yesterday i was working on this double page spread you see here and i'm going to be drawing and designing the queen and things like that later but i thought what i'd do to kick it off is getting to drawing and painting there it is it this little sketch over here where lucy is scowling at peter and saying come on peter um get on with it uh you need to uh draw us a rocket okay you'll find out why later so there we are so there's pete drawing away so i thought i'd do that today so okay pencils at the ready um Oh, ink. That's going to be inking this because I'm going to be tracing it. I've already done the pencil sketch. That's, you know, the original pencil. And then I photocopied it just to use in the layout uh, experiment yesterday. But what I'm going to be doing in this little video is I'm going to be inking this and painting it with watercolours. So stay tuned. Not a guitar in sight today. OK, there we go. Uh, where's the button? Oh, there it is. My name is Squiggly Peter. I love my fish and chips. I love that salt and vinegar as it trickles down my lips. When I'm out there pirating my pencil in my hand, I draw whatever I want to draw, whatever comes to hand. Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, are the pirate. Okay, right. Here's uh, just thought I'd show you some of the materials, things I'm using to create this artwork okay so here's the pencil sketch which i've photocopied previously uh, for tracing and so on this is the paper i'm using at the moment um this is very reasonably priced i bought 50 sheet blocks of this um for about 15 pounds i think uh, which is a great deal um it's nearly as good as the uh bockingford uh, st cuthbert's mill stuff 140 pounds 300 gsm uh and this is a four um, you can get it in all different sizes, of course, but I, I find A4 is perfect for just working on my desktop and this sort of thing. So that's the paper I'm using. I've got a piece already torn off there. Uh, sometimes I'll, I prefer to work from the pad, really, but uh, for some reason I'm tearing them off at the moment. No, there was some logic to that. I think it's because I'm moving it around so much. Okay, so there's the paper. <clears throat> now, this is the double spread I'm working on at the moment, and today I'm going to be doing this drawing. I thought I'd show you a couple of other things I've got here. Um, this is my light light box. It's a modern light box. In the old days it would have been a big wooden box with a piece of frosted glass on the front and some light bulbs inside it. But these days we've got LED technology as you can see. It's about as thick as a <laughs> a thin book. Okay, the, how long is a piece of string? Okay, I mean, it's going to be probably, I'd say, five or six millimeters thick. And it's dead convenient, USB powered, and it can sit on your desktop, taking up virtually no space. Very often I'll work on top of it, and then if I need it, I'll go, ah, there's my light box thingy. So I'm going to be showing you what I use this for today. Other things are a little bit of water. Um, 
Now I've got ink in this little bottle here, um, my Indian Winter and Neuter Indian ink. Uh, I decant into this bottle because then I can squirt a little bit out. I'll do it now. Like this, into this little receptacle thing, which is, I think, the base of some old gift knick-knack thing, but it's actually perfect for this. So I'll put a little bit of ink in there. That's ready to go. And um, the last few years I've been using these scratchy pens. Now these go back hundreds and hundreds of years. They're basically not much more than a feather quill pen uh, modernized uh, when they uh, were able to manufacture pen nibs in mass production in, in, in the Industrial Revolution, I suppose. Um, the problem is <clears throat> with these, <clears throat> now this hot pressed paper uh, hot press watercolour paper means it's um, smooth. I suppose they have to hot press it to, to get that smoothness. The cold press is more rough. There's nothing wrong with that. It just depends on what sort of effect you want to do. For example, if you're doing hedges and trees and foliage or maybe seascapes, landscapes and things, you might want the texture of cold press. But this is hot press. It's very smooth and it allows to the best of its ability the pen to move around without too much scratchiness. Now these things are inherently scratchy. Um, there's no two ways about that. You can get different nibs and some are less scratchy, but um, it's, it's lovely to work with. <clears throat> but you've got to be careful because you can't do upstrokes like that. They've all got to be down or round or sideways strokes, um, <clears throat> which sort of limits you when you're doing your cartoon type drawings a little bit. Um, now, I heard that uh, Quentin Blake uses a, a cartridge pen, and I thought, well, the problem is with that, if you put this ink into a cartridge pen, it's going to clog up. Um, but I've come up with a solution that I can actually dip the cartridge pen in here, maybe this is what Quentin Blake does, and then use it, um, because this area here all floods and fills up with ink, and it works quite nicely. The good thing about it is it's got a rounded, I don't know if that's going to show up, how do we get these things to focus? Okay, well it's got a more rounded tip than the other one, which means I can do upstrokes and things. So I'm just learning, I've only been doing this the last few days with this one. Right, now, there's a couple of things I could do with this. Now let's see, here's the here's the original pencil sketch. This is pencil and just a piece of plain copy paper. Um, I used to like, to, I, I prefer to do drawings on nice paper, but um, because I was improvising as I went for the video yesterday, I just picked up a piece of my photocopy paper and it's on there. Anyway, there we go. One day that'll be worth millions. Right, so here we go. This I'll show you this step, how I trace from the pencil drawing. I could redo the pencil drawing and then ink over that. It's a lot of work and this is a little bit easier. And even Quentin Blake does this. So here's my light box. Turn it on. And there's that and that. Oh, the problem is... Because this watercolour paper is so thick, you can hardly see the design through it. Now, I can see it probably better than you can on the screen there, but it's still going to be tricky work. So, what I do is I photocopy that and set the intensity on my photocopier to, say, plus three, so it comes out more, more dark like this. So, that's the pencil sketch. That's when I photocopied it to reduce it, just to do the layout. Um, and what I've done this morning is I've photocopied it again at full size. So there's the pencil, there's the photocopy with the intensity, the intensity set to plus three. So I think you can see the difference. Right, and the difference it makes you know, isn't, isn't huge, but it's enough to work with. Now I'm going to close the curtains because that will help. I've got, I've got bright sunshine today, it's absolutely lovely. And it's a shame to do it in a way, but um, it has to be done. Now, before I do that, I'm just going to tidy up this workspace a bit because I don't want too much paper flapping around. So I tend to rotate stuff when I'm drawing, thinking. So I've got one of these very handy, this is great, it's by Cricut. Uh, funny little logo. And, and I've had these things for years. They're dead simple, um, but they're dead convenient. I strongly recommend getting one if you're doing this, any, any sort of thing with paper, office work, whatever. There we go. Produces a nice, simple, straight line. And you can tidy things up quite simply and quickly. Yeah, so I want to take the top of that off as well. And I'll show you the reason for this in a second. Okay, so you just tidy that up. And that allows me to position this with a bit of sellotape 
so that I can choose where I'm going to paint. Now sometimes if I'm saving paper, I might paint a design at the top like this, and then paint something else down here, so I'm not wasting paper. But this one's quite big, so and I'm probably only going to do it once. It'll probably make quite a nice picture on its own. Um, so, okay, I'm not going to try and squeeze it all in. Let's be generous, because I do use the space at the side for dabbing and things. Right, so what I'm going to do is sellotape that onto the back, and I like to keep things aligned because, well, that's the way it's designed. So I've got a sellotape dispenser here. Again, strongly recommend buying one of these. I bought one of the this sort of thing for your desktop use. I bought one of these many, many years ago when my children were toddlers. And the enormous amount of things you have to do to help with school homework and all that sort of business, there's always sellotaping to be done. And uh, we had one of these in the kitchen dining room. And you use it for everything. It's just fantastic. So if you haven't got one of those, strongly recommend you go and get one. A thousand uses, as they say. Right. So there's the secured. And that just keeps it all together, you see. So if I'm working and rotating stuff. Right, let's get on with it. Okie doke. So here we have Lucy. As I say, with, with the ink, I work from top left to bottom right. Because otherwise you'd be smudging your work. Okay, oops, just going to shut those curtains. Hope that doesn't roll away. Right, I think that's a little better. Okay, so here we go. And I always like to start with the eyes. Windows of the soul. In Lucy's, in Lucy's case, origins of the scowl. There you go, she's scowling away there. Okay, and her hair comes over here like this. And we've got her ears. Nice big earrings. And uh, yeah, it's going over like this. Still a little bit tricky to see through this, but there we go. And the mouth, let's see. Hmm. Not whoops. Very often when you do the pencil sketch, because you're just sort of improvising, things go more sort of freely and um, you're able to grab the expression more readily and then when you come to ink it you sort of lose some of that spontaneity which is a bit of a shame there we go her shoulders here now this is a bit tricky i said yesterday i was going to work out how to um do her hands her arms crossed so I very often I'll make the gesture myself and work out where things go so for example I'm doing it now and I know her fingers will go on this side here so there's the back of her hand like that and then we have in front of that this arm crossed like that and the other hand here is tucked away under her other arm it's a tricky thing you should try it sometime trying to trying to um, paint or draw arms crossed so in this case, you see, I've reverted to the pencil. Then if I don't get it right, I can scrub it out and sort it out from there. I think by now she's rolled her sleeves up by the looks of it. Right, okay. And then that lovely frilly shirt there. For the line of... Here we go, and I put a sword back in there, didn't I? Here we go. Okay. Right, that's fine. Back to the pen, hope it hasn't dried up now. And I'm just going to ink straight over that pencil, because I did it quite lightly. 
So one, two, three, four fingers, back of the hand, wrist. Okay, that's worked out sort of okay. I was a bit worried about that. I meant to do that before I started this video. Sort that out. There we go. There's the sword back again. And her legs. And I believe that's Lucy done. Missing anything? Just got a bit of a scowl there. There's the other eyebrow. Mm, looks a bit ferocious once you put the eyebrows in. Eyelashes in. Okay. Where are we? Here we go. Just making sure the lines are connected up. Because when I scan it, you see things can go weird. Uh, I think she had some sort of decoration in her arm, blouse thing there. Okay, so that's Lucy. So if I turn off the light now, then we see the ink remaining. Okie doke. Now, I think because I'm trying to keep these videos short, I might just go with painting Lucy today. Yes, yeah, so let's do that. And then we'll come back to Pete in a minute. Or shall we do Pete too? Okay, we'll do Pete too. So, more of my trusty ink. Hoping I don't smudge this. I can see Pete. Pete should be simpler because all I'm doing is the back of his head. But having said that, this is where the eye patch is going to be. I noticed his nose was a little bit too prominent yesterday. And his ears here. And the back of his bandana thing is here and here and his cheeks sort of there we can't really show that he's smiling and his shoulders are hunched up here he's got these sort of epaulette things on his jacket there And of course, as I said in the video yesterday, his collar's hunched up over his shoulders like that. His arm comes down here like this. Elbows on the table. Peter. That's one sleeve there. A little more ink. And in some of the detail over this side okay he's looking quite robust quite chunky isn't he in this one hmm I'll make that even bigger and I'm going to give a nice little decorative thing down the back of his coat there um, and the front of the table edge here, of course he needs a hand, there's his cuff thingy and his thumb and that nice big pencil I think he's actually using these, the Stadler Norris HB number twos with an eraser on the end, in case you're interested. Right. I should have done the paper curly like this. So, here we go. Does he need a pot of ink? No, he's doing it by pencil, isn't he? It'd be nice if he did have a pot of ink handy, though. I might do that later, a little detail later. Okay, so, there we go. Oh, of course. No. He's got a moustache, you mustn't forget that. And his beard. Ah, there we go, there's Squiggly Pete, you see. Once you get the details right, it's a little bit easier. 
Okay, and he's going to be scribbling away. Lots of movement going on there. Not sure what he's drawing. And Lucy's shaking her head a little bit, I think, as if to say, oh no. Right, so there we go. There's the ink bit done. Now, if you give me two seconds to clean out the um, ink. As I said, I've got to do this every time because I don't want that to kill the pen. Right. Now, here's an interesting little thing. I'm going to be using that ink again later, I expect. But in the meantime, I'll just um, show you how I recover that. It's quite interesting. Well, I find it interesting. Um, first of all, now if I leave that there for a few days, it'll all just dry up, and that's a bit of a waste. So I'll squeeze the air out of this little bottle, pop the nozzle back in there. That's like it. Can you hear that? And it sucks all the ink back up, ready for use the next time. A little cap to keep it dry there. It's interesting what you learn on the internet, isn't it? All these little tips. I'll just clean that out like this. And as you can see, there's virtually no ink left. Clever, isn't it? Okie doke. Right. Now, this ink, I think I actually diluted it very slightly with water some time ago. So it dries quite quickly, which is quite useful. Um, there's a little bit of pencil here to erase. Now, this will probably make the camera go really wobbly. And usually I put the hairdryer onto this just to make sure the ink's properly dried before I do this, because otherwise you very often smudge what would otherwise be quite a nice drawing. But this paper and ink work quite well together. So there we go. Okie doke. Just clean that up a bit. Make sure we've got no debris. Put on today's date, which is Friday the 13th of May 22. I like to date everything. Um, it's quite useful to look back and to sort of see how things progress. Um, right, it also helps you find the latest version of things as well. Okay, so I'm just going to get some clean water and um, then we'll start on the watercolours. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm trying to get these paints into the into the scene a bit. So you can see a little bit more of what's going on with that. Now, what I do is I put a tissue here, like this. Here's my fresh, nice clean water. Here's an old mustard jar. I like to recycle things wherever possible. So it's got a little yellow stain inside there. <laughs> it's been thoroughly washed out, I assure you. Right, so hopefully you'll be able to see what's going on. Right, okay, okay. Now, I'm going to be using a couple of brushes. Um, what have we got here? This was the one that used to be best for my fine work, so I've put best for fine on there. Um, but I think recently it's worn out a bit because it doesn't seem to come down to a nice little fine point like it used to. So maybe that's worn. I don't know if brushes do that. But that's quite a nice one actually. Pro Art uh, Pro Lean by. Oh, I've forgotten who it's by. Uh, there's another one. No, it's worn out as well. Well, that one's even worse. <laughs> oh well. No, was it that one? No, that's gone too. Anyway, um, are they Ray, Ray, Tony, but I, I don't know. Anyway, that one. Um, and also I've got a Winsor Newton Cotman round number two there, which is quite useful actually. I picked this up the other day for doing some detail work, so I'll just leave that there for the minute. Right. Um, now. As I said before, I like to. Is that in the camera? There we go. I like to start with the flesh tones, and I have areas of my watercolour palette here which I keep for certain colours, and I know where I'm going with stuff. So down here is where I usually start my flesh tones. I forgot to clean it out. Well, very often I don't clean it out because I'll leave it. Very often you use the same. You come back to the same colours. Like sometimes I have a green. And it's a bit like. Well, there's a legend that they. In, uh, they used to, uh, sort of French chefs used to make a stew and just keep chucking things in and it was days old. But I don't know whether that's true. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I love French food, by the way. Anyway, so now, uh, 
flesh colours. Here we go. I'm going to mix some up with the bigger brush. Um, like this. And I'll start with my light yellow ochre. As you can see, of my various paints, that's the only one where I've got a full pan there. And the reason is for that I go through lots of this. I use it as a base for quite a lot of things. It's a lovely rich yellow colour, but not too bright, quite muted. Yeah, contradiction in terms of, well, you know what I mean. Okay, <clears throat> so there we go. And to that, I'll add just a little dab of um, Windsor Red. As I said in the other video, lots of these pans have almost run out, and I'm sort of curious to see whether I'll get to the end of the book with this set of paints without buying any new ones. I've got some new ones in the drawer just in case. Okay, there's our flesh colour. It's a little bit pinker than usual because I might have put a touch too much uh, red in there, but then we'll see. So I'll just do a dab over here. Yeah, that's mm, a little bit more yellow ochre, I think. So balance it out. So basically two colours, light yellow ochre and Windsor Red in there. Okay, and now what I do is I colour in the flesh visible flesh parts of the characters first. That gives me sort of a base to work to. And also it helps to helps you to focus on which part is the character, which part is the clothing and so on. It helps you put it all together. As I said in the other video, once you've worked out which colours you're going to use and you've got the right brushes, it's like a lot of things in life. If you've got the right tools and the right equipment, things are a lot easier. Um, so it really is just like colouring in. Um, I'm actually thinking about doing some classes. I mean, you know, giving some classes in watercolour painting if anyone's interested. I, haven't, I can't promise anything yet, but I am thinking about it. Not that, not that I consider myself a great watercolour painter, but I know there are people who like all sorts of hobbies. And, um, you know, I know there are people who probably like to learn a little bit about painting like this, if you don't learn it from this video anyway. Right, so there we go. Oh, the other flesh I can see here is Pete's scribbling hand. There we go. So by the time I've done that, this part has probably already dried, and I'm using the same paint to start to add in some shadows. There. there you go, see? Don't want to make it look too vicious. But she's scowling at him, so there you go. And you can see with just a little bit of Oops, this one's still wet. No. No. That's yeah, Pete looks like he's dried a bit, so and as soon as you start to add a little bit of shadow, the thing becomes more three-dimensional. So now I see, just pointing up his knuckles there, and you can start to see he's taking shape. Right, I think I'm going to give Lucy a little bit more colour. She looks a bit pale in the face there. That's it. When this bit down here is dried, I'll come back to that little bit in there. Not sure about that. Okay. Now I'm just going to whiz the hairdryer over that, so I'll just pause a second. Okay, I turned that off quickly because I didn't want to deafen you with the sudden noise of the hairdryer, but what I do is, just to speed up the drying, just whiz a hairdryer over it a little bit. Uh, stops you having to wait around for hours. Well, not hours, but you know. Okay, right, I'm going to make add a few more shadows on this now. So... For that purpose, I'm going to add in, going to darken up that flesh colour with a little, some of the browns I've got here hanging around. Now, as you can see, that's quite strong. And yeah, I'm not 
not sure about that actually. I think it's like she's got a beard. <laughs> right, now I know where that's going. Tiny touch under her lip there. Doesn't seem to be anything on my brush. Mm, mm, a little bit too much maybe. Well, I can always take it out. Right. Okay, some more shadows in here. And you use the shadows to sort of shape, sculpt things. Right, okay. Let's Lucy. And squiggly Pete over here. Get some shadows to the back of your neck. I'm not actually sure where the light's coming from on this one, to be honest. Not too worried. Not too important in this scene. So there we go, that'll do for Pete and Lucy. That's the flesh part finished. And what I'll do then, just to add some interest to the eyes, because obviously the eyes are flat there. Um, now, I believe Lucy's got brown eyes, so I'm going to grab some of this, some of these brands over here. As you can see, I'll sort of mix them together. I want to get a nice sort of hazily brown. Lucy's eyes. There we go, just a dab. That's enough. And then to offset that, I've got some sort of very light grey blue up here. And I find if you just give a little tweak of that to the other side, away from the pupil, it makes it look like you've got a spherical transparent eyeball there right so happy with that um okay i'm going to do lucy's shirt only because i want to do the ha hair next but i don't want to risk the paint bleeding so it's supposed to be a white shirt so all i'm going to paint is a few blue gray shadows so i'm just using a touch of indigo a touch of Payne's gray there and that's the sort of color you get so let's see I think I've decided the light's sort of over here. I should have thought this one through before I started. But never mind, never mind. And again, um, just using the white to the um, shadows to define the white shirt, you see. There we go. That's pretty much it. Okay. Right, that's that. And let's give her that lovely yellow ochre leggings. So. Like this like that and then while it's still wet I'm going to let some more bleed in okay and incidentally that yellow ochre is also the color of the pencil so I'm going to do that while well, I've got that paint going there as well and there's also the base of the brass earrings or gold earrings I've just noticed whoops I've just noticed um, I think Pete should have another earring just visible there also going to help the colour isn't it there we go 
used a different pen for that one. That's fine. It's waterproof, see, so it doesn't run. Okie doke, so while these bits and pieces are drying a bit, I'm going to whiz on and do the lovely bright red bandana Pete wears. That's Windsor orange there and Windsor red mixed up together in the first place. A little bit more yielding. Interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I think on my website at the moment there are some colouring sheets. So if you go to www.pzpress, no, www.squigglypeat, double G, there it is on the screen, .co.uk, and look for the page that's called Free Stuff, there are some colouring sheets there. So whether you're an adult or for your children or, or you're a child watching yourself, you can go there and get some of these sorts of drawings and ink already inked like this and you can start to color them in yourself um, but I'm going to be doing more a lot more of that um, and I may even be producing a coloring book which could be fun now before that dries too much I'm going to add a darker red in there there we go a permanent crimson I believe that one's called that's why I put PC there Okay. Yes, I think I've decided the lights over this 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 side over here. <laughs> right, there, where are we? Okay, and I'm going to add an even darker red by putting in a little bit of uh mauve into it here. Which will effectively darken it even more. I think I'm gonna leave it yeah. No, uh, actually that's okay. I was going to leave it to dry and then make it sharper, but actually that's quite nice. That bleeds in nicely. So that's fine. Right, I may come back to that and touch that up later. There we are. Little squiggle there. Um, right. Uh, yellow ochre might as well do the um the sword here as well uh, very rich bright bronzy gold yellow and i'm going to leave a little bit of shine there a little bit of light to insinuate a shine on metal i'm just going to strengthen up the gold color in those earrings Okie doke. Um, while I remember, put a little bit of shadow on those white spots here. So, just slightly imperfect water there. Red. Okay, so that's those starting to take shape. I think I'll go back and get Lucy's hair going now. And this varies throughout the book actually. There's a, there's some, I think it's sort of like generally dark brown with some bright bronzy streaks in it. So I'll start off with a lighter bronze colour. Like that. And darken it up with another layer of this. These paints have dried up really hard. Doesn't help while I'm using such a small brush as well. Doesn't really help to agitate the paint that much. Okay, lost the richness of her hair there. I'm going to let that dry because I don't. That's bleeding together. 
I don't want to, yeah, I want some cleaner lines. I'm going to let that dry for a while. Now I'm going to put in some shadows around her collar there, just while I remember. Um, so just deepen those shadows there. Again, it's the same colour, just adding more of the same for a little bit of extra depth. Makes it a little bit more three-dimensional. Now, let's uh, finish off those trousers, shall we? Now, I've got yellow ochre, and I want to make them a little bit darker. So I'm going to be using some of this raw sienna and burnt sienna, which is similar to the yellow ochre, but a little more rich. And just give the shadows there. Okie dokie, and right, Pete, let's do the yellow parts of his cuffs, which I think are some sort of old gold coloured leather. Again, I'm using the yellow ochre and the sources and yellow in these shoulder epaulette things as well. He seems to have lost his frilly shirt. <laughs> frilly cuffs on the shirt. Never mind. Okay. Darken up that pencil a little bit there too. And in passing, I'm going to put a little gold streak inside the lining of his coat there, and some gold buttons. Oh, and of course, the collar itself. Mustn't forget that. That's what I set out to do. There we go. Oh, wow. Okie doke. Now, I'm just going to go back to the handle of that sword, and that's just going to be plain old black or Payne's grey. Not too worried about what that is exactly. But we'll make it black like that. Well, that stands out quite nicely then. Um, anything else? Dark black like that? Not really for the minute. Right. So I'll come back to some browns to define Pete's collar a little bit more. There we go. Okay. And the cuffs of his little leather. Yes, yeah, cuffs, little leather cuffs there. Right. Now, I think we haven't got a huge amount to do left. Pete's coat. But while I'm on these brands and things, I think I'm just going to the yellow ochre do a little bit of the tabletop. Now that's going to be paper there. So, And this little line here where I squiggled something I don't really want, I'll just remove that in Photoshop. It won't take more than a couple of minutes. Not even that. There we go, there's our table. Maybe I'll just insinuate a leg or something like that. Okay. Now, the blue for the coat, and this is where I do my blues over here. There's some murky bits and pieces still in there, so I'm Wash that out a little bit. And we have this lovely Windsor blue. Lovely rich warm blue there. Ironically, yes, the blue can be warm. And we'll just dab it in. Like I said, it's just like paint by numbers. In fact, maybe I should do that. Do some colouring sheets, paint by numbers. It might be interesting. Using the watercolour names.
one of the fun things about watercolors is the way the paint moves and it's especially good fun when you're doing clothing because as you will know as you know sometimes it can be quite difficult to make something look like fabric uh, you know because of the way that fabric falls and folds and so on but using watercolors very often there we go you can get quite interesting effects now a little bit more Windsor blue and I'm going to add a touch of the almost depleted indigo over here and you should see that bleeding quite nicely in places so down here like this um, a little bit here here under here there we go now if you let it bleed like that it'll give you a soft edge which is nice depending on course of course on what you're painting you know which bit of it you're doing why If you do it on dry, it'll give you a, a harder edge. And you create combinations of those effects to create the look you want. So there's my cloth, squiggly peat. Yeah, I'm going to retire this brush. I think it's causing me trouble. It's just not fine enough anymore. It was very fine at the end, but it's gone all, maybe the, the actual hairs have worn out. Right, um, well actually one last thing with that brush, just going to add some dark brown under here. There I'll see, table legs. Okay, not a lot to do now. Um, I'm going to give some texture to that paper. It's sort of nondescript what he's actually drawing there but that's fine because we're not supposed to see anyway so i'm just going to make it look like it's something there we go i'm going to darken that pencil side of that pencil even more yes and his hand there we go. And I'm going to add some shadows to the edge of that desk. So again, some of the darker brown. Maybe a bit of Payne's grey in there as well. This bit's all going to be dark because he's leaning over that. And the shadow of the paper there. Shadow of his arm. And also have some shade on these table legs as well. Whoops, being a bit clumsy today. I think it's because I'm doing it slightly faster than I would normally do. Only because I don't want the, don't want the video to eat up too much of my hard drive. Right, so I think that's pretty much it. I'm going to add a little bit of dark brown shadow to the bottom of that to bring it out. Um, and I think he needs Pete's ear there, help to define that, his nose. Is that finished? I guess it is. Okay, so hope you like that. Um, right, Squiggly Pete co.uk go there for more okay i think i'm going to call it th that's it for this part of the video because it's already got, got up to over 30 minutes i think and then in the next one i'll be showing how i fit that into the layout it'll be scanned and shrunk down to that sort of size with the text placed around it okie doke right thanks for watching folks enjoy oh and have a wonderful day there's the button Right, well I hope you enjoyed that little demonstration. Um, 
I'm going to be doing these as quickly as possible over the next few days, so keep watching on uh, Facebook and YouTube and see, and I'll notify you when I've uploaded another one. Um, if you haven't already, please sign up for my email newsletter at www.squigglypeter, two Gs, lypeter.co.uk and also go to YouTube if you're interested. Go to YouTube and search for Martin Harvey, that's M-A-R-T-Y-N, Harvey, H-A-R-V-E-Y, The Poet, and you'll see some of my poems. I should put some of my poems on here, shouldn't I? Yeah, maybe I'll do that as well. Okay, anyway, thanks for watching. There, where was I? Oh, yeah. Bye. Finally got it right. Where's that button? <laughs>